Hello everyone, thanks very much for coming. Uh, very happy this week to introduce Linda Boothroyd. Um, Linda did her PhD here, working with uh, Dave and was studying facial masculinity. Um, she then got a ESRC postdoctoral fellowship to go and work at Durham University, uh, where she's now a senior lecturer who has supervised a number of outstanding PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I'm going to keep this very short and hand over to Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is only about 75% as scary as I thought it was going to be standing at the front of this room. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, although uh, those of you who've known me for a while know that I do a lot of work on faces, um, I've been getting more and more interested in bodies in the last um, sort of um, eight years really. Um, in part actually because of a lot of the things that you can do with bodies that arise out of the facial literature. So um, hopefully you'll see as I go through how some of that has happened. Um, and um, I'm starting to think that the, sort of the, 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 the natural life course of, a, of an evolutionary psychologist is to start out as an adaptationist and end up as a cultural relativist. Um, <laughs> and this, is, this, if you like, is uh, an explanation of why I've, partly why I've ended up taking so much of that kind of route. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about TV and, and towards the end about Barbie, but the main thing is it's about how we think about bodies and body weight and what we think is attractive. Um, Oh, okay, good. So I will, ah, okay. I will start off um, talking just a little bit in general terms about body weight ideals. Um, I'll then go through some of the possible sources of variation um, that might exist. Um, I'll talk a bit about experimental data, and then I'll spend the bulk of my time really talking um, about some very new data coming out of research we're doing in the field in Nicaragua on TV and body weight preferences, and then I'll end with some even newer data we've got in the UK looking at dolls and children's body weight preferences. So, um, ah, 20 years ago now, um, people in the evolutionary psychology field were getting a little bit excited about something called waist to hip ratio um, and this idea that there could be this universal preference for a curvy female shape because maybe that meant um, that you were in that particular fertile phase of your life, you know, you're post-pubertal, premenopausal, you weren't pregnant. It was, people were getting very excited thinking this might be a universal thing that people find attractive about female bodies. Unfortunately, um, anthropological data started to suggest maybe it wasn't universal. Furthermore, if we think about other elements of female bodies and specifically female body weight, it is and has always been very, very obvious that we do not have anything approaching a human universal preference for female body weight. Um, this is a reasonably good representation of the Western athletic thin ideal, where you have a, a very slim woman, very toned these days, um, and in some respects, relatively androgynous shape. Um, here we have one of the earliest known depictions of the female body, which is the polar opposite of this one here. And even in across, looking across time within relatively narrow frames of time, sort of 200 years here, you can see variation from a, a sort of actually, well, I think Botticelli's Venus is, is slightly more based here, at least on the male torso read into that what you will. But um, looking at Titian, you have a much more realistic female body, but still significantly lighter than this body here, where we start to see heavier bodies at periods of time. Different periods of time, um, artists have been more or less likely to show um, different weights of female body as attractive. And we do see the same kind of variation um, across cultures as well. So it's it was never going to be appropriate um, to think we had some kind of universal. Um, the only thing I was going to say is that, um, all, apart from this one, all of these, you can argue, are the representations of one artist about what um, is a beautiful female body. Um, and in that context, then, this might be a more appropriate depiction of our current um, one man's vision of the um, beautiful female Venus. Um, but the point is, there's still an awful lot of variation. Um, to put it in another way, this is Duchess of Devonshire. She was 200 years ago considered arguably the most beautiful woman in London society. And this is the actress who was chosen to portray her, one of the thinnest actresses in Hollywood. Um, so why do we see so much variation in the kinds of um, female body weights that people find attractive? There is empirical data to... to cover all of that I was just talking about, but I figure the pictures are more fun. Um, 
one argument that has been put forward, especially with reference to cross-cultural variation, is could it be local adaptation, i.e. that when you live in an environment that has um, very low levels of nutritional resources, high levels of nutritional stress, the um, best thing for you to do is to be attracted to people who show in their bodies that they have access to nutritional resources, i.e. heavier people. Um, so could you see local adaptation, genetic adaptation, that the people who are attracted to adiposity are more reproductively successful because of that and therefore um, this preference gets genetically passed on? Um, and um, that is countered by some really nice cross-cultural data from Martin Tovey. Um, so he got, he and his colleagues, got Zulus who were living in London um, to rate a whole bunch of female bodies for attractiveness, female bodies with known weight, height, BMI, etc. Um, and they could then plot how attractive they thought each body was against the BMI of that body. So they did that for Zulus living in London, who'd been in London about six months. And they also got data from Zulus living in KwaZulu-Natal, um, and then they could compare them. And we can see up here, Zulus in KwaZulu-Natal, peak preference, it's around about here, BMI of about 27, and they continue to find very overweight and obese bodies very attractive. Um, Zulu migrants living in London, peak preference is about a BMI of 24, 25, and they're not quite so keen on the very large bodies. Um, if we look at black British people's preferences, which are the same as white British people's preferences, um, Peak BMI preferences round about BMI 20, so bottom end of healthy, and they're pretty intolerant of overweight here. And what I really like about this data is that the Zulu migrants are very clearly um, in between the Zulus in South Africa and the people of African descent living in Britain. Um, <coughs> so this can't be about genetics. You've got uh, people from the same ethnic group showing different preferences living in different cultural contexts. Um, so, um, Martin Tovey's explanation at the time was that this could potentially represent adaptive learning of local health and status cues. That if you live in KwaZulu Natal, um, being overweight is a sign of high status because it means you have money to get the food. Um, being overweight also means that you do not have AIDS because then you would be getting very thin very quickly. And both of these things are actually quite important. And therefore, it is very good to be big in KwaZulu-Natal. You move to the UK, suddenly you're surrounded by um, governments and the media telling you that being overweight is very bad for you. Um, you see a lot of very thin people in, in high status positions in the media. Um, and that tells you that actually in this new environment, Thin is good and big is bad, and that you learn this new association. And it's really all about learning local cues to health, local cues to status, and that we're sort of primed to, to do this. Um, <coughs> and there's certainly evidence, uh, if we go back in social psychology, to support the idea that people can pick up this kind of covariation without even knowing that they're doing it. Um, so you can show people um, images of people with different kind of features and um, then show them other images that vary in the same way, and they can, they can learn associations. So that's been done with longer versus rounder faces and how fair a marker that individual was. Um, it can be done with hair length and kindness. There's this one on gender and, and mood down here. But this is the one I've sort of emphasised, so, um, because it's health-related, basically, that, that seeing pictures of, I think it was children in different colour T-shirts, being active, not being active, and later thinking that red t-shirt meant um, healthy and sporty and a green t-shirt meant unhealthy. Um, so people learn these kinds of covariations and then apply them later on. Um, <coughs> the alternative, and this is how I got involved in this, was that you could also explain it in terms of visual diet. So yes, Zulus come to the UK and they are surrounded by a culture that tells them that fat is unhealthy and thin is good. Um, however, they come to the UK and they're also presented with UK visual media, which are full of very, very slim female bodies. Um, and the people on the street in KwaZulu-Natal and London have the same BMI in general, 
But the actual visual diet in total, living in the UK, when you're seeing billboards, um, especially living in London, seeing billboards, seeing magazines that you walk past in the street, seeing TV, um, you are seeing a lot more thin people than you would have seen living in KwaZulu-Natal. And maybe it's just a more simple adjustment of how you prototype bodies and not about you, you making all these extra um, connotations about what weight means. Um, so you can certainly show in facial adaptation studies that exposing people to a face manipulated in one way or the other leads to people being more attracted to faces with that manipulation or the other. So you can manipulate facial prototypes and that changes what people find attractive. Um, you can even do that for male versus female faces separately. Um, so there's certainly evidence to show that when, when we look at faces we can do it. And uh, Winkler and Rose in 2005 sort of looked at this with bodies. They showed participants either um, a stretched body or a compressed body and found that their preference for body width essentially on this scale shifted up if they'd been shown this body or shifted down if they'd been shown the compressed body. The problem with this study, however, <coughs> is that this is a simple um, horizontal one-dimensional stretch. Um, so you can explain this with very, very low level visual effects. Um, it, you know, you've just scaled the person's entire visual world, essentially. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything about bodies. Real bodies, the bodies that people really see, do not vary in this kind of nice uniform way. Body fat topography is very variable. Uh, people are overweight in different ways. People are underweight in different ways. Um, and you can't use something this simplistic to test that hypothesis. So, um, this is what we did, Martin and I, <coughs> teamed together to see which one of us was right. And um, we gave our participants um, computer-generated bodies. Um, these are the early ones. They weren't very good. They get better later on. Um, and they varied very slightly in weight from quite thin bodies to quite large bodies. And we assessed essentially how much they liked the thinner bodies in each pair to get a sort of thinness preference score. Um, we then showed them either classic female models and um, beauty queen contestants, plus size uh, models or beauty queen contestants. Um, so these are sort of the, this is the, the typical Western media diet. This is the plus size version of it. Um, and then we also tried to take out any positive valence that you might have with weight. Um, and we showed either very emaciated underweight bodies in leotards and these figures actually look quite ill they are anorexic patients who were photographed uh, in the lab or we showed overweight bodies um, in in the same plain grey leotards um, <coughs> and we looked at thinness preference at pre-test and post-test in each of these conditions and what we basically found was um, an interaction between manipulation body weight and time so um, they went one way and or the other across time, depending on the, the body weight. But there was no interaction between uh, whether the bodies were positively or negatively valenced. So essentially, those in condition A and C, those who saw the very slim or underweight bodies, their thinness preferences went up there and there. Those in condition B and D, who saw the plus size figures, their thinness preferences came down in both cases. Um, so it, it looked like visual diet effects were happening here. People like thinness more, even if the thin bodies you are showing them look really unhealthy and really unappealing, and vice versa as well. Um, however, we also had these combined um, stimuli conditions where we showed this sort of, this, this associated pair that says thin good, fat bad, or thin bad, fat good. Um, we didn't get an effect in condition E, but we did in condition F find that thinness preference again went down when we showed this countercultural combination of images that, that said, you're all Western students, but actually we're trying to tell you that being plus size is good and aspirational and being very, very thin is not. Um, so um, oh, it looks like both adaptive learning or both associative learning, I wouldn't go so far as to say we showed it was adaptive, but associative learning and visual diet effects both seem to be happening in the laboratory in the UK. The question then is, um, what happens in a real environment 
when media actually varies um, and access to visual media varies without um, people having to move thousands of miles from Africa to the UK to experience that change in media. Um, <coughs> so this work um, is funded by, by Leverhulme um, and we're looking at an area of Nicaragua um, specifically on the Mo Mosquito Coast but in particular focusing on the Pearl Lagoon Basin um, where they are currently electrifying areas of the forest. They're starting to get access to electricity there, they're starting to get access to Western media. So we can look at what happens when people gain access to Western visual media through television without them having migrated, without their diet having changed, without them having um, experienced all the things that may have happened to the people who migrated from South Africa to the UK. Um, so we collected data, we, we collected some data in Managua in the capital here because we wanted an urban sample to compare our participants with and we mostly worked, um, are working in the Pearl Lagoon Basin there. Um, <coughs> this is the Pearl Lagoon Basin. Um, I am very jealous of my postdoc who currently gets to live there. Um, uh, the, the data I'm mostly going to talk about today is drawn from this village Kakabila here and from Square Point here. Um, Kakabila has television and they've had television for about six years. Um, in Square Point they don't have television and the only way they can access television is if they're passing through some other settlement. So they have very limited, very rare access to Western visual media. They don't get any uh, magazines out here. Um, so the only way for them to have any visual experience of Western culture is through televisions. Um, and uh, when they do have television, it is on a lot. Um, the people who have television will have it on pretty much all the time they're around the house. And there aren't, very, there aren't particular um, strong boundaries to the houses. There's often no, there's no doors, there's not always walls. So people um, in the, in the neighbouring area will spend a lot of time watching each other's TVs as well. Um, <coughs> just to give you a little bit of um, more background on the settlements, um, the, uh, the average age was relative, there's no significant difference in the age between them. Um, there was some ethnic differences, um, although they're relatively similar within the basin. Um, so we didn't worry too much about that. In terms of other demographically important variables, um, so in Managua, they're... Okay, that's the wrong way around. <laughs> in Managua, they're more acculturated than in Square Point, who are more acculturated than those in Kakabila. Um, that's quite important because um, we don't want our results to be just driven by general acculturation, how much they identify with the dominant Spanish and, and North American culture. Um, those in Kakabila and Managua were more educated than those in Square Point. Um, those in Managua and a lot more than anybody living in the Pearl Lagoon. We asked them about their hunger, so scale of 1 to 10, how hungry are you right now? Um, there was almost no variation. They all used points 4, 5 or 6, so it didn't turn out to be a very good measure. We did also ever ask them, how many hours is it since you last had a meal? Um, and in Managua, they had eaten considerably more recently than in Kakabila, who had eaten more recently than in Square Point. Um, and finally, um, we asked them whether they had a TV, whether their friends had a TV, whether anyone else in their settlement had a TV or whether there was no TV. And basically either came to they had access to TV or they didn't. And it wasn't terribly useful. So what we concentrated on was how much TV do they watch. Um, so in Managua, they're watching the most by a long way. They're watching on average three hours a day. Um, almost nobody in the sample was watching less than two hours a day on average. Um, in Kakabila, they're averaging more like two hours or less a day, and in Square Point, 1.63 hours a week on average. Basically, a few people would travel um, and watch TV. Most people didn't see any. So, um, they were tested for their body preferences in exactly the same way as the KwaZulu Natal data. They were shown a lot of bodies of varying known weights and asked to rate them for attractiveness in, in English or in Spanish. Um, this was all done on a laptop um, in a, a, a quiet area, so Jean-Luc and Tracy tend to rent a room or a, or a little house to do testing in in any particular location they're at. Although this shows two people watching together, most of the time it was just one person 
I think this was posed for the photo. Um, so then what we do is we process their uh, body shape preferences. And I extracted two, um, two scores, really, for analysis. Um, the first thing we do is so we, we plot each individual person's data on this cubic function, um, and we calculate their peak BMI preference. So on that function, what's the point at which they like BMI the most? Um, and then because there was some, some variation in which parts of the scale they used, so to try and get some estimate of what was going on in the top half of the distribution, um, I looked at the, the gradient between their peak BMI preference and their peak BMI preference plus 10. So we took, um, we took that um, angle there uh, as a measure of gradient. So this is what it looks like if we look across the three settlements groups together. Um, <coughs> it, it looks a lot like uh, the Zulu paper data. Um, those in Managua, the capital city, have a peak BMI preference of mm, 20... 22-ish, um, and it goes up and then it comes quite sharply back down again, just like British people's data. Those living in Square Point who have next to no access to television, um, their peak preference is up around about 29.30, and then it remains high at the top end. And those in Kakabili who've had TV for six years, um, their preferences are intermediate between the two. Um, which was, when I say it's exactly what we were hoping to see, obviously I sound a bit callous, but <laughs> it is exactly what we were hoping to see. Um, the, the peak BMI preferences all significantly differed between groups. Um, there was no interaction with sex either, so it was the same for males and females. Um, there was a, a significant difference between the gradient in Square Point and the gradient here in Kakabila, so that was shallower and that was a steeper drop. There was no difference between these two gradients. Um, so th there does seem to be good evidence that the settlement um, that's, that's got the least television access also has um, the body preferences most like those people living in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, <coughs> we then looked um, at the individual data, the individual level predictors. Um, of preferences. So we initially put in age, acculturation, education, income, last meal and TV consumption. Um, I had to log transform TV consumption to get it normal, that's why it's that little LN. Um, and um, when we put it all in for everybody, quite a lot of things fell out as significant. But the problem is the people in Managua are so different from the people in the Pearl Lagoon Basin, it isn't actually a very good comparison. Um, so we split them by location, we split them by sex. Um, so this is looking at peak BMI preference in these models here. For the males, age in Managua, education in the villages. Um, the females in Managua, so women who grow up more, more like we do here, um, age is important, last meal is important, TV is important, although in the opposite direction, but there's only 17 of them, so I don't want to be too reliant on what their data say. What is most interesting is these females living in the villages in the Pearl Lagoon Basin. So living very similar subsistence basis, a um, bit of farming, bit of fishing, bit of cash income from the fishing of turtles, um, but with very different levels of access to television. And the only significant predictor of their peak BMI preferences was TV consumption. And if we look at preference gradient, <coughs> Um, what we see, again, just focusing on this bottom section here, the only thing that predicts the gradient, preference gradient um, for the females living in the rural villages is how much TV they watch. So their idea of what female bodies should look like seems to be significantly driven by TV and not much else in that area, at least. Um, now, in terms of how that actually affects them and their ideas about what they should do as individuals, we did also ask them if they were trying to change weight. So we asked them if they were trying to lose weight, if they were trying to gain weight or muscle, or if they were not trying to change weight. Um, and if we look across locations, there's nothing going on with the men. Quite a lot of them want to gain muscle, but um, there's not a lot of variation. Um, there is significant variation amongst the women across locations and um, most women in Managua want to lose weight 
about a third of the women in Kakabila want to lose weight and one woman in Square Point wants to lose weight. Um, so that was significant. The, the, the main significant difference, if you do it pairwise, is between Managua and Square Point with Kakabila Intermediate. Um, <coughs> but it's not a big end for that kind of comparison in the chi-square. Um, and again, we looked at it um, in terms of individual level predictors about what could be driving that. And um, in Managua, all predictors were thrown out. Um, and in the villages, CV consumption was borderline, but it was borderline in the predicted direction. So if I'm going to take a one-tailed P, that would make it significant. Um, and again, it's TV consumption. The only thing affecting this is TV consumption. Um, interestingly, if I do a hierarchical model and I put in BMI preference to that, BMI preference doesn't contribute any more than TV consumption does on its own. So it's not necessarily acting via BMI preference. Um, there are a lot of adverts for diets on TV um, that the women are watching in, Monag in, in the Pearl Lagoon. So it could be that they're directly thinking they ought to diet rather than it being via body preferences, but it looks like there might be something going on there too. Um, <coughs> now we did also do a little bit of work looking at it, a little bit. we did a lot of work on this as well, looking at facial preferences. Um, um, but I'm going to talk about facial preferences specifically from mestizos living in Pearl Lagoon um, because we wanted to make sure that we were getting rid of any possible ethnic differences here because there are m more more important ethnic differences to bear in mind when we start looking at some of our facial variables. So we've, we've got um, facial data from Managua, from Square Point again, or from the mestizo living around Square Point, and also from this village Pedregal, which is a mestizo village, um, more inland. Um, and the first thing we did was, we sh sorry, <laughs> it's very hard to see on the screen. We showed them faces varying in how white they are, so manipulated faces um, from black to more Caucasian, or from Hispanic to more Caucasian, or black to more Hispanic. So all these, these pairwise um, choices we gave them are between the more white and the less white face, um, <coughs> which is why we wanted to do it very much within one ethnic group. And we didn't see any effects of um, location on how much they like white faces. And we thought we would, because there's a lot of white people, um, or whiter people, are on the TV that they're watching, and we thought they're going to see that as high status. They're going to want to, um, they're going to prefer these white faces more. And we didn't find that. We did, however, also show them um, Carlotta Buttress's um, masculinity stimuli. Um, and again, something interesting happened with the women. So for male faces, there were absolutely no effects on how much they liked masculine or feminine male faces. But the for the female faces, there was a significant sex by location interaction, which looked like this. Um, <coughs> so the higher the score on this y-axis, the more they liked the masculine female faces, which is not what you would expect people to like. And indeed, a lot of the data, certainly for all the men, um, is below that 50% line. So they're mostly preferring the feminized faces. Women in Managua, they seem to definitely significantly prefer the feminized faces. Women in Pedregal, not so sure. Women in Square Point are significantly preferring the masculine female faces. Um, and if we think of Square Point as being the poorest, the least media access, Pedregal, low level media access, lower than Kakabila, but possibly more than Square Point, and Managua, fully, fully urbanized, westernized, acculturated. Women, in terms of what they think female faces should look like, they're more preferring the feminized, beautiful female face um, the more they're living in a place that is fully acculturated. And um, this isn't as fancy as the Rick, because I, I ran this off before I ran for the train yesterday. Um, but again, if we look at the correlations, um, again, TV um, watching is coming out as a significant predictor of how much they like the masculine and female faces. The more TV they watch, um, negative correlation, so more TV they watch, the more they like the feminine female faces. So it looks like with the faces and the bodies, 
there's some evidence here that really what's going on with all of this is it, it seems mostly driven in, in our data by really what women think that women should look like, um, which takes it out of the sort of mate choice area that I'm usually most comfortable working in, and it's more into this idea of female body image, female senses of what, of what, of what women should be. <coughs> so um, to summarise the Nicaragua data, um, I think we've got pretty good evidence for TV affecting body preferences in the rural Nicaraguan women, possibly their eating behaviours, and that is controlling for acculturation, controlling for SES, controlling for how hungry they are. TV seems to be doing something that all the things you would expect might be the confounding variables cannot explain. Um, <coughs> there's very weak evidence for hunger doing anything, and we thought hunger was going to be a big thing as well. Um, but we can't really find any evidence for that in our data. We thought hunger would be a big thing for the men, and it just doesn't seem to be. Um, and overall, the drivers of male variation are actually very unclear indeed. Um, we haven't been able to elucidate that very much. So, that's TVs and bodies in Nicaragua. <coughs> One of the other things that sort of started to come out of th this, more I thought about body image rather than body attraction, um, is that there's, there's, it's not just TV and magazines and, and these kinds of visual media that affect what we think about bodies and what bodies should look like. Um, we can also think about it in terms of dolls and the, the dolls that children grow up playing with. And we know that children start reporting a desire to be thinner from six years old, if not younger, in the West. Um, so it starts very, very early. They're talking the talk, even if they don't necessarily know what it means, quite young. Um, and we know that body dissatisfaction only increases as they get older. Um, so Gardner et al. measure body dissatisfaction in a fairly um, commonly used way. You give children an array of bodies, ranging from emaciated to morbidly obese, and you say, which one of these is you? And they might say, mm, this is me. And then you say, which one of these do you think you would like to look like? And they might go, mm, I want to look like this. And then body dissatisfaction is this difference here. And obviously you counterbalance that sort of thing, ideally. Um, and that sort of discrepancy between what you think you look like and what you think you ought to look like seems to increase as children get older. Um, <coughs> <coughs> so, sorry, that's incorrect. It should be Dittmar, Halliwell and Ives. Um, they showed, they used this method of assessing body satisfaction um, and they showed girls aged five to eight pictures of either Barbie, um, looking very, 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 very thin here, um, projected BMI of about 12, which is severely anorexic in a real person, um, or they showed them pictures of this Emmy doll, which had been endorsed by the American Dietetic Association as showing a healthy female body weight. Um, the five-year-olds um, who had been shown Barbie um, had higher body dissatisfaction measured on this scale um, than those who'd been shown Emmy. They didn't find any effect at eight. However, this is basically, this is showing them static pictures of dolls and children don't spend a lot of time looking at static pictures of dolls. Children mainly spend a lot of time playing with dolls and that's a very different level of interaction. It's much more tactile, children get a lot of information about the world from interacting with it, so that's probably the more appropriate thing we should be looking at. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. Um, and um, one of the things that has happened since the, the previous paper um, is that there has been particularly a lot of interest around this doll, Lottie. Anyone who has young, girl, young children might know about this. Um, she's based on the average proportions of a nine-year-old, um, <coughs> and therefore she represents to, to a six-year-old child, this is the body you might have in three years, not this is an ideal body that you will never have even when you're 17, like Barbie. Um, so we, we gave children either Lottie and, and Dora, because I thought we should get another sort of larger, more healthy child-shaped body in there, or we showed them, or gave them even, Barbie, and this is Claudine. She's, um, she's a, a character from Monster High, which is a cartoon and a series of toys. Um, I measured her waist and her height. Her projected BMI, based on those, is a BMI of nine, which for an adult female basically means dead. Um, so, 
the other thing we did is actually we did we did a, we did a pre test pre test post test, um, which I think is quite important in this kind of design. Um, <coughs> And rather than just showing them pictures, we actually got them to play with the dolls. We said, um, either what adventure do you think these characters got up to yesterday? Or if that really wasn't getting them to play with the dolls properly, we said, well, use them to tell me the story of your favourite film. Favourite film was almost without exception frozen, obviously. Um, so we had 21, we've currently got 21 seven to nine year old girls, um, mainly drawn from um, schools in Durham. Um, 10 in the skinny condition, 11 in the normal condition. Um, they were mostly tested in pairs um, because we, that way we could get them to interact together with the dolls. Some of them were tested individually. Um, and we used an interactive body preference task um, where they, they um, were shown a body, a computer graphic child's body. I told you they got better <laughs> later on. They're much better now. Um, and uh, they had to move the mouse left and right, and as they moved the mouse left and right, the body got bigger or it got um, skinnier. And when it got to the point that they said, that's my answer, they clicked the button, and the data comes to us as just a percentage score of the screen. So although there's 11 actual pictures that they're scrolling between, we get the more like the visual analog scale related to that of exactly where they stopped the mouse and went, me. Um, so we asked them um, to do, we, we asked them first to say, make this body as much like you as we can. And we wanted to do that first every time, um, just to get that baseline established. Then we gave them a distracted task where they had to choose between random flags and, and, and objects and things like that. Then we asked them to make the body as much like they would like to look as possible. Um, and then we asked them to do the same thing with some adult bodies to see how the dolls were affecting their perception of adult female bodies. Um, so, uh, oh, there we go. Actual self-destructors, ideal self, ideal adult, play phase, and then we did the post-test. So we omitted two girls because they were very distracted throughout and we didn't think they were actually paying attention to what they were doing. Um, so ideal adult, let's start with that. Those girls playing with the normal dolls, the childlike dolls, absolutely um, no change, but there's a drop in the um, ideal adult BMI of the girls playing with Barbie and the Monster High doll with um, a really quite significant interaction term, 0 0.004. Um, <coughs> ideal self, um, massive drop in the um, girls shown playing with the skinny dolls, slight increase in the girls playing with the normal dolls. Um, the interaction was highly significant. In terms of the pairwise comparisons, this drop is significant, that increase is not. Um, and then when we, when we subtract um, their ideal self and their actual self to get body dissatisfaction, um, the interaction is marginal. Um, but we only have 19 girls in the analysis at the minute, so I'm not too surprised. Um, and basically, it looks like body dissatisfaction is reducing in the girls showing the healthy dolls, and body dissatisfaction is increasing in the girls playing with the underweight dolls. Um, so, <coughs> that's it, actually. Um, so, we're obviously, we're, we're in the process of, of increasing our sample size on this. I think it's obviously important to um, see what's going to happen with that interaction in particular. Um, but the common thread from both the Nicaragua cross-cultural work and from the work we're doing with children in the UK is that exposure, whether it's through visual media or through playing with toys, um, to essentially underweight female images um, seems to, certainly correlationally in, in Nicaragua and experimentally in our children, induce change in the body size preferences for women, um, body size preferences and body satisfaction in girls. So I should thank uh, Tracy and Jean-Luc who are my PhD student and postdoc who are out in Nicaragua right now, Abby and Sophie who collected most of the data with the school girls, uh, Liz, Martin, Mike, Mark and Rob who are all part and parcel of the uh, Nicaragua project and also Levy Hume Trust and the CCBC for money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I just have a question. Um, 
within two groups, it seems that the normal dogs might be a bit younger than the yeah, ones yeah. in the skinny group. Do you think that had an effect on the perception of it? Yeah, um, that's one of the things that we've been talking about. Um, because potentially they could be projecting, like you look at an adult doll and you think, well, I'm going to think, I want to think about an adult body and maybe they think of that as thinner. Children actually have a lower BMI than adults. Children are slimmer than adults, but because adult females potentially have more curves, they think of the waist. And I still think that's buying in, though, this, this archetypal adult female image that is actually a bit underweight, if that makes sense. Um, that potentially is invoking a very slim adult female body. What we're planning to do in the, in the grant proposal we're writing right now is to actually start controlling for that in, in various different ways. Yeah. yeah. I, there, is, there is now an adult plus size doll, uh, but it wasn't out in time for our data collection when we started. Um, I, I missed how long they actually get to play with the dolls in that. Yes, experiment. my apologies. I didn't say. Um, <laughs> uh, it ranged between five to ten minutes. Um, we wanted it to be at least five minutes. Initially, we thought we'd get them to play for ten minutes, um, but it rapidly became evident for some of these girls. They just didn't know really what to do when they were doing a lot of this. Yes. We have checked that the, there's no difference between the two conditions. About how long I mean, my there. actual question, or <coughs> wonderment, whichever it is, I mean, it's a very small time. Mm -hmm. These kids have an awful lot of time spent with real people. Yes. With their own dolls. Mm -hmm. With yeah. television, with Facebook, whatever. Yeah. If five to ten minutes is having that massive effect, do you think it's because an important person like you or your assistants mm -hmm. gave this thing? Is it sort of authenticating it as perfection? Yeah, it's um, the one you choose to ask them to model with. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Um, so we know that um, that there's some evidence suggesting preschool girls, so sort of four to six year olds, I think it was American preschool, um, are playing with dolls for about two hours a day, which is a lot of exposure to dolls. Um, and um, some other research looking at other things, like um, looking at magazine reading, um, suggests both correlationally, actual natural reading of magazines seem to be associated with poor body esteem in teenage girls. Just giving girls randomly a, a subscription to Cosmopolitan for six months um, resulted amongst the high risk girls who were sort of more problematic to start with. It significantly decreased their body, their body satisfaction. Um, so I think there's evidence from other scenarios to suggest it's probably real. The other thing is you can do this in the lab with adults and faces and, and things like that. And <coughs> the, the experimental lab things um, that we do, uh, I think some of the stuff on faces suggests the adaptation effects last about seven minutes. But of course, when you're being exposed to this over and over and over, I think I'm not surprised about the size of effect that we got. I think that's just maybe a reflection of what's happening in your brain ev regularly throughout the day. And throughout yeah, they're not so much real, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, that, that, that graph of the, the ideal body size, that's the first time. I do a lot of, I've done a lot of research that should be quite depressing, like on, on father absence and things like that. Uh, that's the first time I've ever looked at any of my own data and actually been upset by it. It was quite disturbing. Yeah. 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 yeah, my question turns out is not unrelated, I think. Uh, so you've used this expression I haven't heard before, visual diet, yes. which sort of implies that we've got a, a long-term cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. But in most of the data, I couldn't differentiate that from, from the old well-known phenomenon of the adaptation level. Yeah, I think, I think visual diet is, is just a reflection of what you're seeing day to day and I wouldn't be surprised if sort of as I said if, if actually visual diet effects are basically this constant adaptation effect happening over and over and over. Um, but the thing about the adaptation level is it's temporary and goes away. Yes but then the question is when you're, when you're adapting to the same thing a lot does that then induce long-term changes and I think the only way we're going to know that is with longitudinal <coughs> data. 
Um, so do you see it, can you induce a visual diet effect and then see it get more and more pronounced? Um, what we're hoping, so they don't have much TV in Pedregal, they're getting electricity in Pedregal right now as I speak um, and we're going to go back to them in a year and see what's changed. Um, and my hope is that obviously they won't have had any particular changes in their economy, in their diet, in anything else. The only thing they will have changed is that they will have more TV exposure. And yes, it could be associative learning, but that will still tell us actually if something's changing. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? So pretty much, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, Ken, I know what's the question about. So, so just, I guess just following that up, I mean, I, I think because not all these, I, I don't know all these literatures in terms of, but it seems to me some of these things are obviously fairly short term, like the associative learning stuff you're talking about is, you, you, you talk about as if it's fairly short term. Um, but there's this kind of longer term, of course, evolutionary information, it's very long term. But I, I think when you put together your lab stuff with the Nicaragua stuff, and the London stuff, the effect seems to be medium term, right? Because you're getting changes over, a, you know, people who change culture are changing over a period of months or years rather than over a period of hours or never, right? So, so yeah. isn't that an argument that in a sense the changes you're talking about are, you know, not just associative effects? Uh, it might be a cumulative associative effect, but it has a kind of energy Right, or a, a sort of yeah. momentum, but that momentum can be changed culturally. I think one thing, one thing to bear in mind with, for instance, the, the Zulu data um, is that they were tested when they've been in the UK about six months, but they weren't tested when they got off the plane. Uh, so we don't know how quickly that change has happened. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to do in Nicaragua was look at it as it was happening, like go back to the same village month after month after month. Um, Things being what they are, it's taken so long for this plan to give Pedregal electricity to actually happen. I don't know that we're going to have a lot of time to do that. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's what we need. We need uh, to, to see that happening a lot. Or, for instance, in the Stice paper where they gave the girls a Cosmo subscription, it would have been great to get them tested on a monthly basis to see, actually, if there's a change that plateaus or if it is this slow cumulative effect. I suspect, I, I think we are quite flexible um, and, um, you know, we are constantly updating, I think, our, our visual prototypes. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's a sort of m small to medium term effect that just gets constantly topped up whatever environment that you're in. Um, yeah, although the Tamsin Saxon has data showing people's preferences to masculinity are related to whether they went to a single or mixed sex school um, after they've left the school. So that maybe has a longer term effect. I don't know. I it's, it's, it's always going to be both, isn't it? <laughs> Everything is always both. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a question right at the back? Oh, there was. <laughs> uh, yeah, my question is uh, kind of related to Ken's in a way. Uh, I was just wondering when you were going through the data from Nicaragua, if there's any evidence of uh, some kind of court effect of uh, the uh, effect of TV exposure and people's preferences. So, uh, for example, if you're, say, 50, you spent 40 years, um, your preferences are sort of shaped by something else, and then you yeah. finally get access to TV. Um, is there any difference amongst the younger and the older? Yeah, so... There wasn't a lot of evidence for age doing much. When we analysed all participants together in the regression models, um, the one thing that dropped out was age, actually. Put, put all the locations, ma males and females, together. Um, and I certainly know from some of Martin Tovey's earlier work, um, they don't find a lot of effect of age on body weight preferences in Western data, despite the fact that the average female size in the media from the 50s compared to you know 80s through to now has has dropped a lot um so um that suggests that it, it it's 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 not set there's not a critical period for learning it and you don't learn it less as you get older um the only difference might be that older people spend more time with older people and older people are more likely to have had a bit of middle age spread um <laughs> and, and therefore that's going to affect what they see as normal um but no, there's, there's, not, there's not strong evidence for 
that sort of thing happening. Okay. So, and additionally, uh, I was also thinking um, the measures of the hunger yeah. um, hypothesis, I just felt that they weren't necessarily uh, the yeah. best, you know. Yeah, um, no, I agree, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting more data at the minute trying to really drill down into hunger and not just how hungry are you, but do you ever have days where you don't have enough to eat? And also looking at typically what they eat because they do have stunted growth in this area. So they're clearly not getting enough nutrients when they're kids. Um, so we know that they have some kind of nutritional stress. We just need to find a way of tapping into it on an individual level and being able to say, actually, yes, these are the nutritionally stressed people. So we're asking a lot more about seasonality and, um, and the particular variety of foods they eat. Because um, some of them, you know, they're living on cassava pretty much all the time. Some of them have much more varied, much more nutritionally rich diets. And so that's, that's where we're going next. Yeah. One more? Oh, two more. <laughs> the doll experiment with the small girls, I'm wondering if in your planned experiments in the future you're going to control for status markers, things like accessories, hairstyle, right. makeup. Ah, I'm not about that. I forgot to say. So, um, we tried to control for that as much as we could. So these aren't actually, these aren't the actual pictures of the dolls we use. These are much better pictures <laughs> I got from the internet. Um, so Barbie and Lottie were both wearing riding gear. Um, Claudine was not in this outfit. Claudine was in a, a basketball outfit and Dora was in leotards. So we tried to control for outfit. Um, but yes, yeah, so and one of the things we're, we're planning to do moving forward is to control outfit even more and certainly try and take some of the makeup off this one <laughs> in particular because it's pretty excessive. Yeah. yeah, it's impressive research, and uh, I don't want to denigrate it because I, I, I think it's really uh, doing the right stuff to try to cross culture and uh, what's going on with kids. Th there are loaded terms in terms of talking about body dissatisfaction, yeah. and uh, you've been asked about adaptation effect. If you get the girls to redo, what do you, where do you, what's you? Um, you should, if it's a visual oh, effect, yes. that, that would bump that up. I didn't but I want, I want to slide, keep yeah. going. Um, I mean, uh, it has been claimed in the medical literature that parents simply have forgotten what body shapes are like because of their visual diet, and they think their kids are fine. Their kids are not overweight when yeah. objectively they yeah. are. And here we've got, I mean, if we take visual diet explanation seriously, um, parents are looking at Barbies, they're looking at other things. Why haven't they got it right for their own kids? I think that's because parents are judging ki their kids as kids. I, 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 well, no, you're absolutely right. So, so there's, a, there's a big thing at the moment with parents underestimating how overweight their children are um, because we've become accustomed to a different shape of child. Yeah, we can't have both that claiming that we're, 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 yeah. we're actually shifting to a heavier perspective and simultaneously saying actually the, uh, the, the, the ideal is going down because people are not, yeah, okay. Yeah. So th th this, there's a couple of issues. One is that it's parents' view of the children and the child's view of bodies is not obviously the, the same. And the parents aren't looking at the dolls to the extent and the way that the children are. The children are interacting with the dolls a lot. The parents are mainly looking at the dolls to go, you know, get that back to the toy box or something. So I, I don't think you've got the same level of, of interaction with the dolls. Um, I also think one of the things we should... I don't know if this has been done. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would tell me if it had been done or that re seems relevant. But if we have categorical, a degree of categorical um, ways of, of doing this, that we think about children's bodies in one way and we think about adults' bodies in another, that might explain it. So, so Tony's stuff where you can, you can adapt males, not female faces, or females, not male faces. If there's something like that going on with bodies, um, with age categories, then that might be actually quite interesting. No one's done it, so we should probably do it. That's what I'm um, can I very briefly take chairs for a minute and say, um, could you tell us a bit about the Frequency Disney conversion? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, <coughs> Uh, the, uh, uh, we, we asked the parents, like, how many dolls do they have? They all had dolls. Um, how often do they play with them? Um, how much TV do they watch? How much films like Disney do they watch? And how often? Um, and the only thing that correlated with the initial ideal self scores was how much 
Disney they watch. So the ones who are watching more Disney preferred thinner ideal self at the start um, than those who watched less Disney. So we put it in as a covariate to make sure it didn't create interactions. And it didn't, but it's, yes, it's just there as a little covariate that we're controlling for in this interaction. Um, I don't know if that's going to stay when we get more participants. Well, um, we've all grilled in quite a lot. Um, we will be going to the next room for uh, wine and crisps, so feel free to come and ask more questions then. I just need to present you with <laughs> psychology and oh. Thank you. <laughs>